I'll literally show kids a tomato and they will ask me, what is that? Now you've got an interesting background, Campbell, because you were an entrepreneur, you were involved in PayPal early on, uh, and then you be decided you wanted to get into food and you became a restaurateur and you're a philanthropist doing amazing things in the space of food and education for kids, particularly around healthy food and gardening. Um, your basic mission seems to be putting food on the table in America that's real healthy food and, and getting everybody access. So how did you go from being like a tech entrepreneur in the 90s to being so passionate about nutrition? What, what got you on fire about this? You know, I am, um, I've had such an interesting journey with food. I, I grew up as a kid grew up cooking. So my mom, who is wonderful and she's a great mom, but she's self-described a very bad cook. And so I, I but she's cook. a nutritionist, right? Nutritionist. I was actually a doctor <laughs> in dietetics, like real yeah. like science level, you know, work, working in hospital wards, you know, uh, and, and unfortunately with our, our uh, diabetes ep epidemic, um, that, that really, really is, is tearing our, our, a lot of our communities apart. Um, so I grew up with a very much, uh, 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 what's the right word? Brown bread and plain yogurt kind of lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as a kid, you're like, come on, this is ridiculous. Oh, the other thing she would do is she would, she would cook uh, boiled squash, and she she loved it. And like, this is for a kid is the worst thing you can <laughs> eating. She didn't make it too sexy to eat healthy, is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So she said, you know, when I was young, I was 11 or 12, and she said. Uh, Okay, you, you want to cook? I mean, let's go to the grocery store, get get whatever you want, and cook. Um, and I and I, I the first thing I, I asked the butcher for was was a chicken, and um, and I said, how how do I cook it? And he 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 said something which is really the same instructions that I've kept my whole life is, you put salt and pepper on it, some olive oil, just rub it around, and you put it in a hot oven for one hour. And back then, you know, the, the temperatures and things were not really that good, but um, yeah, yeah, it's like a four hundred degree oven. For an hour, and pretty much that's the recipe. Now, in our cookbook, we have all these delicious things. You add lemon, you add some herbs, you add some garlic. You, I mean, of course, you can make it better, but but the um, but the fundamental recipe I did when I was so young, and it came out so well. And it was like a you know I think that matters a lot when you cook. You know, did your first dish come out well? Yeah. And not only did it taste good, but what was beautiful about it was my mom and my brother and my sister. They they're very very busy. They're very in their head. And I am as well. But but when I cook, I'm, I'm kind of in my body. I'm in my, in, I'm able to be present. It, again, it's like a meditative thing for me. I didn't really realize, I didn't even know the word meditation. I just kind of did it as a way to, to calm myself at the end of the day. And then we would all sit down and we'd all just eat and we would talk. How beautiful is that? And it's something I've kept with me forever. So whether I'm cooking for my kids or my wife or my family or my brother or sister, it's, 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 a, it's a gift that I, that I, I love to cook for, for folks. And it's a gift to me as well. It's a gift to me really more than anyone else. Cause I get to, I get to sit down and connect. Yeah. You know, Kim, it's, it's so true. What you're saying is that we often think of cooking as a chore. We've been told that you should leave the cooking to us, right? You deserve a break today, quote unquote, from McDonald's. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and we've, we've kind of, taken something that was just the heart of the family and the community and our lives and, and kind of put it aside. And so most people are not eating food that they cook at home. They're eating food that came from a factory. They're not eating it's very processed with their and families. Blood. They're not eating. It's, it's the, it's the yeah. cause for, for our epidemic is the processed food. You can cook simple meals that, that can be done in 10 minutes. In fact, we have a few of those in our cookbook, but the, the it's, I mean, I'll even do my scrambled eggs recipe for, two minutes and yeah. it's meditative. It's, I mean, yeah. it's literally two minutes. There isn't a faster way to have breakfast. You couldn't stand in line at Starbucks for, for that amount no, of time. No, exactly. And, uh, and it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, actually in your honor this morning, because you and I have talked about uh, gluten in the past is I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to work on a tortilla recipe, kind of like a, a huevos rancheros recipe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, um, uh, I, uh, I came up with a trick that I think would be fun to share is uh, for the tortillas, you know, you get them out of the fridge, they're cold. Yeah. Um, what, what a lot of people do is they'll kind of they'll warm them on a pan or put them in the oven. Um, what I did was I put them directly on the gas flame. Ah, yeah. And it actually 
takes a moment for for it even to cause maybe even 30 seconds for it to cause it to burn so like within like 15 seconds to 20 just flip it and yeah. then another 15 seconds and then you're done yeah and so kind i learned that putting on a fire hard me to learn a, uh, <laughs> a free a recipe for that's great eggs. i'm glad you hear that, <laughs> I'm glad no, hear that. So thank you very much <laughs> I don't know if that's going to be a habit or not, but we'll see. Well, you know, it actually tasted good. I'm all about, does it taste good? That was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, no, it's just, it's what you're saying is so important. And, and the beauty of your cookbook, it's called The Kitchen, literally The Kitchen, is that it it uh, invites people back in the kitchen where, where we've been shoved out by the food industry and it invites us to think about this as a joy and a pleasure, as you said, a meditation, as a way to connect with family and friends. You know, I, I have the same way with you. I love to cook and I love to cook for people. So probably yeah, it was one of clear my when we were with you, you, you love it. I mean, and your, your the food, your, especially your vegetables, you're so vegetable for it. Wow. Magical flavors coming out of these vegetables that, 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 I mean, and we do the same at the kitchen, the vegetable recipes in our cookbook, they might actually be the best recipes of the whole book. I mean, your carrots at, you know, the carrots are exactly so they're, damn they're, good. <laughs> they're like a, they're, they're roasted and then you know, with an Urfa dressing, which is a, a dressing from this from from the Middle East, and it's it's just so unusual and it is so good. Yeah, uh, it's, so you think carrots like that's not a main dish, but it's actually no, so exactly. We've got, in our restaurant, we have our, our waiters come and that they'll they'll literally say, "Look, at, we know no one orders carrots normally." You have to order the carrots. It's like a conversation at every table. <laughs> it's true. It's really true. It's really true. They're so good. And so you're you're basically taking things that are ordinary and making them extraordinary. And and you're doing ways that are simple, that are easy. That beautiful are, ingredients. You know, I mean, you, yeah, you get some good carrots. The, the flavors are so wonderful. And then there's a sweetness to it. There's a beautiful caramelization that happens. Um, and so it is also ingredients driven, as you know. And... Um, for folks who who go, I mean, Whole Foods, of course, is fine, but go to the farmer's market. What's fun about a farmer's market is the, the carrots are different per farm. Like one farm will have a slightly different style of uh, different seed even. And you can play with um, with the, the with carrots in ways that are more fun than the same carrot every time. And um, not that the same carrot every time doesn't work, but kind of cool to go and get it from your farmer's market. That's true. Yeah. I mean, it kind of, when you, your whole approach reminds me of, you know, when I was in the blue zones in Sardinia and in uh, Icaria, where, where food was so central to their life and they grew it, they cooked together and they ate together and they were there. It was, it was big, a big event when you had lunch or dinner, it was like a big event and the family would get together, the community would get together. And it was, it was so beautiful. And that's really what you're inspiring us to do. And I, I think, you know, maybe you could share a little bit about the story that happened to you in 2001 and 9-11 when you were living in New York City and you heard the plane hitting the building uh, and it was sort of was a powerful thing and, and what you did as a result of that to help the firefighters and what that changed. Thank you. Me. Yeah. You know, so, so my my story was I was a tech entrepreneur. I sold it in uh, my, my company in 99, um, remained an investor in PayPal, so, but, I, but I wasn't passionate about tech and I... Um, I was passionate about food. I'd grown up cooking food, yeah. and uh, and I um, went to the French Culinary Institute, which is a very intense old school. Uh, you know, screaming at you. I mean, literally, like this is their <laughs> their, their, their their teaching technique. It's like Gordon Ramsay uh, <laughs> on steroids. He actually probably learned from schools like this, so he knows he he's trained that way. And uh, so I graduated just before nine eleven, and um, of course, not sure what I was going to do after cooking school, but I. Uh, woke up on Tuesday morning, as I still remember it very clearly, to this strange sound. And I was down by Chambers and Broadway, very close to the World Trade Center. And then the doorbell was ringing from the doorman. Uh, old in New York, you're in these school buildings, and, and there's a doorman there. And he starts ringing the bell, and, and I answer it. And I'm like, he just says, a plane's hit the building, a plane's hit the building, a plane's hit the building. And I'm, and I'm just, I'm in that sort of New York zone of like, some idiot just flew a plane in the building. And so I kind of ignore it. <laughs> yeah. And I take a shower and I tell my, my wife, wife at the time, um, uh, I'm going to go get some coffee. And so I do my routine. I go down the elevator and I go to the deli across the road. I get out of the elevator and the doorman says, another plane's at the building, another plane's at the building. And I still don't quite get it. And of course you're in, you're in tall buildings. You, you, you can't see the World Trade Centers at this point. You, you, all you 
you know, and there wasn't any panic. In fact, I went across to the deli and there were, there were like 30, 30 people in line. And I thought, that's a bit strange. That's not some normal behavior. This is a normal New York deli. And I feel like, you know, in retrospect, people didn't know what to do. So they just kind of. So they got coffee. <laughs> and uh, just like, exactly. This, but uh, it just felt weird. But then as I was paying for my coffee um, over the radio, that we heard the, the Pentagon got hit. And that is when it just, the, 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 your whole body just kind of it just dropped and you're, oh, oh shit, we are, we are under attack. And everyone just started running. You don't even know which way to run because you can't, you don't know what's going on. Right. And, um, and so we, we started to see people running uptown. I went and grabbed my wife and we made it to Canal street by the, by the time the first one fell and the, the, again, still not knowing which building fell, but something big was going on. The, um, the, the dust cloud that came and stopped about half a block before Canal was like a white wall of dust. And people were coming out of that in cars or holding onto the sides of cars just to get out of the, out of the dust cloud. They were covered in white paste of, du of dust. Um, and I can only imagine, um, we, 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 we were part of the health uh, check. We were in the zone where, where we were required uh, by law to do a health check every year by the, by the government to, um, oh, to track. Because of the pollution, right. the toxins that came. Yeah, the lung, yeah, track your lung, effect on your lungs. And, and it did affect a lot of people. Thankfully, we, we missed that dust cloud by half a block. It was, um, it would have been a, a life, uh, life changing from, from a health perspective. But we're very grateful for that. And then we, we, we kept running. We got, we got to Union Square. And then when I, we turned around and I could see the, 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 for the first time, I could see the World Trade Center, well, in that case, one World Trade Center. And you just, you just look and stare and you kind of look, well, what's something missing? And, oh, yeah, there's a World, one of them's gone. And then as I'm looking, the second one just starts to fall in slow motion. And you just can't believe it. You, you, it, it was like reality breaking. It just isn't possible in the your whole head. world changes in a moment, right? The whole world changes in a moment, and um, your whole view on the world, your whole view on what is what is what is what is a grounded reality, like all of that is gone. And uh, so we um, we got to my mom's place on Twenty Second of Broadway, and she had um, invited uh, anyone who who needed help to stay there. So we had about eight or nine people in this small apartment, and um, it was good actually. We had like a little. I didn't know, I knew my mom, but I didn't know the others. It was good. We had a little, little kind of um, group therapy. Like, what's going on here? Are we yeah, all alone? Yeah. Um, I remember Elon calling and saying, uh, get out of there. Just get out. Just get out. Because he was so freaked out. And, uh, and, and something just said to me, no, I don't, I don't want to leave. You know, this is a, it's a strange, um, illogical thought to say, no, I, I know that I'm in danger. We don't know what's coming next. But this is my home. I'm not going to leave. So uh, a few hours later, we get a call from uh, the city that my mom was quite well known at the time uh, for dietetics. I mean, and um, uh, she I was asked if, they, uh, if she wanted to volunteer for the for the firefighters to cook. And um, they were just kind of calling. Can you imagine there's a million people trying to trying to volunteer? And she says, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I can't cook, but my son just got a cooking degree and he can. <laughs> And, and so, so, so she volunteered I, you. I, I know. So I mean, it's an amazing twist of fate that um, I also had a security pass because I they give it they give it to anyone who was below Canal Street to because you, you live down there. And so after about I don't know seven to ten days, they allowed me to come down back into my home, and I for six weeks I cooked for the firefighters. Went to this restaurant called Boulay, and it, it was blown out. Oh, Boulay, yeah. David yeah, Boulay's a good yeah. friend. He's a great, yeah. Great. And now, of course, not here, not there anymore, but it's, but, um, blown, completely destroyed in the front of the restaurant. But the, but the back of house and the basement was a huge kitchen. And so we used that kitchen to cook. And I started peeling potatoes. I was, um, completely bottom of the rung, but that was fine. You know, I, I, I just was honored to be there. And, and the chefs who were rotating in and out would do two or three days at a time. And I just kept, I was there every day. And it was a wonderful way to process the trauma in a sense. It was peeling potatoes it didn't sound good, but actually 
when you're in that zone, it's perfect. <laughs> and then I worked my way up to pasta station and then saute. And eventually, because I was just there all the time, I was um, the guy that would drive the, the cooler of food in an ATV down to ground zero. And the, there was a makeshift a gymnasium, a sort of gymnasium that had turned into a cafeteria. And so we take the food and we would, um, we'd be in the, in this, uh, room and, and the firefighters would come in from literally these giant piles of metal that were still melting. You could, you could smell the, the burning, the melting. And weeks later, it's just, I'll never forget that smell. I'll never forget that smell. It was just, uh, horrible. They come out of it and they'd be, they'd be in these shells and they take these shells off, which are covered in dust. And then they'd have this kind of gray look about them. And we would feed them, I think, the best food they've ever had. And we put so yeah. much love into it. <laughs> yeah, Boulay, for those who don't know, is the number one restaurant in New York for like a decade at the time. or 20 years. <laughs> yeah, at the time. And it was like, it was like. It, <laughs> it was no longer because of that, but it, at the time. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But, um, but the, uh, it was, it was truly the best chefs in the world cooking the food. And I was there to help. And I was cooking as well. And I, as I said, I got the honor to work my way up. But the, but the most beautiful thing was actually just watching how food would change their energy and they would be completely quiet. We'd, we would feed them this beautiful food and then they would slowly start coming to life. And it was a, about a 45 minute break. And you could see by the minute 20, they'd have a little energy and then 25. And then, and then by the end of that 45 minute break, they were talking and laughing and connecting. And then they would just put their their shells back on and they'd go right back out to dig through these piles of metal to, to help save American lives. It was truly the greatest honor of my life to to be part of that. Uh, it was then that I was like, you know, I um I had this, I, this, this the sense of community was so incredible. It's still still so beautiful. I was like, you know, I, I've, I've been a tech entrepreneur. I've got a cooking degree. I know what I'm doing. I, I love food. I, did, I was afraid that food would become like a, would, would, would get ruined for me if I did a business. But I think I was also insecure about opening a restaurant because that's what I love. So I said, you know what? I'm going to do it now. I, I have no excuse. I, I know how much I'm going to love this. So uh, my wife and I, we drove around the U.S. Um, we went to uh, cities that were closer to the west side of the U.S. because I had a lot of work, work in, in the Bay Area. So I just wanted an easier commute. So it was a Jackson Hole, Boulder, Denver, down to Santa Fe, and then all the way up the West Coast in the month of February, because February is it's easy to easy to be nice in any in any any month, but pretty hard to be nice in February. And and even though Boulder it gets cold in February, it's just beautiful, crisp, cold, and um, and it's also a mountain town. So I, and I grew up at, at a higher elevation, and so I, I resonated with that with the, the feeling of the air. And so, and it's also a great restaurant town. I think it's one of the for the one of the best restaurant towns. It actually has the same restaurants per capita as New York City. It really is oh, a wow. buzzing. Really, huh. really amazing. I don't, I don't know because I just go to your restaurant when I'm there. Yeah, right. so. Exactly. <laughs> and it's uh, or your kitchen, or your uh, actual kitchen, the kitchen, <laughs> or your kitchen. And, and my, exactly, and, and and it's a uh, wonderful. But so, so we opened the kitchen. But the the reason I got into into healthy food and 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 sourcing. I would say, well, the healthy came from my mom, but the sourcing came from Hugo, my co-founder. So uh, Jen, my, Jen, Jen helped with the, the design. Hugo was my co-founder and chef, and he, he was this uh, great chef that I, I I was walking down the street one weekend to moving to Boulder, and my dog came off the leash, went up to this guy, and he was English, and I'm South African, and we just bonded a little bit over that. But then he said he's just taking on this the chef position, and I'm, I said, I'm here to open a restaurant. And so he offered to have me work for him in $10 an hour. And I did that for a year. And <laughs> I love just, that going from selling in PayPal to, go, yeah, to no, exactly, right? 10 bucks an hour. And honestly, it was awesome. I had such a good time and I learned so much from him because there's a difference between New York and, and his, his style is very Italian, very much about ingredients, very much what can, what's the least amount of things we can do to this food to, to make it, to make the flavors come out. And French cooking is more of a six hour process where you, you're yeah. you really are, you know, what's the, getting that source correct. And, you know, it, it, it really is a diff, completely different way of thinking. And the other thing that he brought was this idea of working with farmers directly. 
And working with farmers directly back then, people didn't use email. They didn't have iPhones. Um, as strange as it sounds, it, it, I mean, I come from Silicon Valley and five or six years later, people still were not using email. I, I just couldn't even understand it. <laughs> and, <laughs> but they're farmers. I mean, they're the farmers they're email. <laughs> and so, so the farmers would, would uh, so I, but I agreed with, with Hugo because his food was so good that I was like, you know, okay, I'm, I'm going to go figure this out. And so I got to know a lot of these farmers. Um, they really trusted Hugo. And so we, we, they were willing to work with us. But they would, they would come and bring food and they would drop off uh, you know, broccoli or, or, or carrots or things like that. And, and then they would just leave a paper chit. And we've, yeah. got, we've got to like now find the paper chit and we've got to put enter it into some system and then we've got to pay them or we've got to pay them cash. And, and we're like, this yeah, is yeah. really hard. You know, there are systems for this. It's called email. Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so um, one farmer at a time, we got the one email. And, and I, I remember one farmer saying to me that um, uh, and this is in the early 2000s, right? By, yeah, 2000, 2002 to 2004 um, when we were opening. So, so he, he, um, he was just intimidated. I mean, you can imagine you never, never put a computer in your house and you never set it up. And he was an older, older guy. So I, I went to Best Buy with him. Uh, and helped him buy a computer. I didn't pay for it, but I helped him buy a computer. Went back to his home. I was like his grandkid, you know, just setting up his uh, his modem and and uh, his DSL account or whatever, and and setting up the computer. I was like, okay, now you type in here what your what what food you have, and then we get the message, and then we will send it back to you. Yes, please, we'd like it, and then they tell us how much it is. And we, by the time you arrive, we are ready to pay to pay you, and it was such a Simple thing, but it was a big jump for for these farmers. So, anyway, so my, I think my my um, uh, what do you call it? My contribution to the farm to table movement because it was really happening all over the country at that point was helping was tech farmers. enabling it. <laughs> yeah, tech enabling it exactly at the simplest level. <laughs> and it was it was a joy. It was an absolute joy. These these farmers were so because you know everyone else is doing it. They just needed someone to help them do it. It wasn't like they they were anti technology. They were like, yeah, this is kind of cool. But it was a little bit like I was. They were my grandparents, and I was uh, the kid, the kid changing, you know, the double, the zero 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 on the VHS machine. <laughs> so I'm the kid, like let's let's put the clock in there. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's such a great story, Kimmo, because you know, out of tragedy came something beautiful, which was this insight that you love to serve people that you love to cook for people that it was a place where people could come together and belong and feel connected and laugh and heal in some way it's really medicine and you know i think that's a powerful thing that, that that's turned into your life's work and your cookbook the kitchen which is is named after the restaurant in boulder that you're talking about is is a way for for people that sort of get back invited into you can check it out here it's great and we'll link to it in the show notes but uh, you know, I had a similar experience. I went to Haiti after the earthquake and, you know, was just in the most intense situation, serving all the wounded and the injured in the hospital and really wasn't thinking about myself at all. And I was working 20 hours a day, nonstop for weeks. And, uh, you know, and out of that, I also sort of had the insight that the, the community was so powerful that came together to, to help solve this problem and to help bring relief to the people who were suffering there. And it just was clear to me that the community is medicine. That just as food is medicine, yeah. so oh is my goodness, community. community is medicine. Absolutely, yeah. and it, it is maybe one of the most important medicines, and that's clearly one of the things in the blue zones. It's so important is is they're never alone, they're never isolated, they're always part of the community. And we see loneliness being an epidemic. Even the Surgeon General has sort of almost said loneliness is the new smoking in America because yeah. we're also it absolutely is. Isolated. You know, the, uh, there's a study, um, uh, the Harvard study about. Um, longevity, and it's, it's a, the longest running study uh, in, in in the country. It started in the 1930s, and they took a wealthy wealthy group of uh, I think it's just I think it's just boys. They might add a woman later, but uh, a wealthy group of kids on one side, and wealthy and, and actually kids from the um, poorer part of town. As you can imagine in, in Boston that that would that would be that would be pretty poor. Pretty poor. And yeah. they just started to track them. And these folks are now in their in their 80s or 90s, and um, I guess they're in the 1990s at this point. And the, um, the the they went back and looked through all of the things that could have helped them live longer. And and of course, these folks grew up not during a time when we have the modern medicine, and and, and there are a lot of 
you know, new beautiful things that have been happening over the past 10 to 20 years that, 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 we, that we, we, we do have to um, uh, learn. And I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a student of life. I want to constantly learn. But what's so powerful about this was the only thing that was consistent about the ones that lived the longest were people who had deep relationships at the age of 50. Yeah. With, with their wife, with their friends, with their family. Um, those deep relationships stayed with them and um, and they were not lonely yeah. and, they, and they wanted to live and they and they wanted to live a, a vibrant life with their community. And those blue zones, I was actually just down with Dan, with Dan Buettner in um, in Costa Rica in one of the blue zones. Oh, and um, and it's all about community. It's all about uh, the food there is simple, but it's fresh and it's delicious and it's um, it's it's community that, that, that makes you kind of, um, gives you energy, gives you, gives you life. And, uh, and I, I just love when I, when I, when I wrote this cookbook, I was like, why am I doing this? I know the cook restaurant's been around for a long time, but really what I've seen over the past few years, especially because of the pandemic is how much lonelier we are. And, um, we went through a, a training, unfortunately, to be lonelier through the pandemic. Let's all learn how to, watch more TV or let's learn how to play more video games. It's really sad. And and now we've come out of it like, oh, well, we have to untrain ourselves. And so I thought if I wrote a cookbook that was about community, it's, it's called Cooking for Your Community. And um, it's a it's really a story of, of what ha has helped me live a joyful life. And I cook with my kids um, at least once a day. Um, I just cooked this this morning for the family for breakfast um this when i did the tortillas to uh yeah <laughs> uh, <laughs> i mean it's good by the way and again i'm i'm telling you i'm giving you praise here that, that was really good <laughs> and um the uh but it, but it's really about cooking with my family and my friends and i'm i stay connected with them and i still eat out of course i, I love to eat out but i like to eat out with my family and friends i like to use it to break bread with someone i don't know uh restaurants were wonderful for meeting someone who might be your partner for the rest of your life uh, this, the, the restaurants play a beautiful role. Uh, it's uh, both, a, you know, you can cook at home with your family and friends, but also go out and eat with your family and friends. And um, uh, that, that's, that to me is, is, is certainly my secret to longevity. It's so good. It's so good, Campbell. And, you know, one of the things you do is not just, uh, you know, bring people in your home or bring people in your restaurant, but you, you sort of built this network of community in the farmers and the local uh, supply chain and, you know, in a reciprocal way by giving them your compost and they give you the food. And you sort of built this incredible network and provided food in a way that. Yeah, was we, we had delicious. wonderful farm, farmers. One of our favorite farmers when we were in the early days was, uh, was, was a, a farmer named Ann Cure and uh, with Cure Farm. And um, that's a good name, Cure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. And, and it became, it became such a, um, Beautiful relationship. We we not only would buy food from her um, because she was just she was just our favorite one of our favorite humans, and uh, then we also started to raise animals on her on her farm as well. And and it was a re, it was a powerful way to learn the the food system from the perspective of the restaurant. You're ordering food and it arrives and you prepare it. You want it to be the best quality possible, but to learn the perspective of the farmer was another gift that we got. It wasn't just these relationships we got. We got, we got to go out and farm. And um, uh, it was, we'd bring our kids out there. I, I, I want to give total respect to the farmers because it's, it's a daily, it's a daily hard, it's hard work daily. And, and you're dealing with weather, with climate change, with weather volatility. It's a, it's, it's a tough, tough job, but also it's beautiful. It's also, we got to be on this farm and, spend um time with with Anne and, and her family and uh that we, we it really was a gift that we got was to to work with these farmers nowadays because of technology is really advanced all of the farmers are online and all of the farmers have iPhones and all the farmers uh, are able to do that so we're able to source from farmers that are a little bit further away or or, or have a bit more sustainability practices um always thinking first about the, 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 the quality of the food, then, then about the animal welfare, how are they treated? And um, uh, when it comes to, to, um, to vegetables, you know, you know, who, which is the best farmer for, for this ingredient or that ingredient, it's really been, it's a 20 year journey now. We, we've got farmers 
that um, have worked with us for, for two decades. It's really incredible. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's great about what you're doing also is that you're sort of demonstrating how you can have a beautiful restaurant that's outside the industrial food system, where you're getting from local farmers, where you're in a reciprocal relation with them, where you sort of have zero food waste and you sort of bypass the whole industrial food system, which is- Yeah, actually the zero food waste was such a thing, you know, 20 years ago, Hugo drove this as well. Um, he worked at a restaurant called the River Cafe in London, which is it's just really one of the greatest, uh, still, still around, still doing great. One of the top, if not maybe the first farm to table restaurant. A shape in East was in California and this one was in oh, London. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and so, so um, but, but the problem back in the seventies, the technology was so just wasn't there. So it was just really, really hard to work with farmers. And then, but those two, those two restaurants did figure it out. Now, you know, fast forward 50 years, uh, those farmers were all on, on, um, uh, they're on, uh, uh, technology. But one of, one of the things that still needed was when it come to zero waste was, um, we, we had this compost. We had farmers that needed it, but there was a law at the time that did not allow us to give it to the farmers. You know, there's a, there's a fear of food poisoning that if you don't look out for properly, it, it is. And, you know, fair enough. And, um, but we, but we had a farmer that, that would take it and, um, but take it, take it to, on a timely basis, not allow it to, 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 uh, uh, to get bad. And, um, so, so that happened for a little while. And then, and then another entrepreneur in Boulder, and love Boulder, um, they, they came along and said, well, why, why, we know this is not, uh, not allowed, but we know, you know, you're doing it. Would you be open to being our first restaurant that we work with? We take the compost and we, we actually process it right away and we turn it into a, uh, almost a, a, like a soil, but it's not soil, of course, it's based on food, but it's, it's something you turn into the soil and it looks and feels like soil and essentially fertilizes the soil with the compost. So we got that partnership as well, early days. And ever since then, we've just, we've, you know, we've got uh, our three different, um, uh, every single garbage can is three. It's, you know, you've got compost, recycling and trash. And we get it down to, you know, one small, for a restaurant that is very busy, we get it down to one small um, actual piece of trash, like a little bag of trash for, um, um, every few days, because most of what we do is recyclable or composted. Yeah. I mean, it, it's great. And, you know, it was also great is that you haven't just sort of stayed in a restaurant that you realize that, you know, the food system is broken at a larger scale and that kids are suffering uh, more than anybody, you know, we're seeing 40% of kids or 45% of kids overweight. Uh, Going into kindergarten in some neighborhoods, 40 to 45% are, are obese. It's, it's a, yeah. it's an epidemic. And we're seeing, you know, just to sort of record a podcast on the effective ultra processed food on mental health, on violence, aggression, behavior issues, ADHD. And, and, you, you know, you, you decided you wanted to work in a broader way and shift the food, food system in schools. So tell us about, what you did with Big Green and why you started that and why, why it's such an important part of your mission and work in the world. Yeah, you know, that's another uh, powerful story. I've, I've got a, um, yeah, it's, it's a hard, hard, to, hard to share, so give me a moment. I think the, um, uh, when, when the restaurants were, were doing well in the 2000s, I, I started to, to get curious about tech again and stuff. But I, but I, but I really was not happy. I was genuinely and unhappy with. Okay, I've made money in tech. Now my restaurants are successful, and like I'd, I'd gotten into that place that I think a lot of people get into. Where, what am I doing? You know, what, why am I, why am I working so hard on something that I've kind of lost my my passion for? And um, I was on a ski hill in 2010 with my my kids, <clears throat> ages four and six, and I <clears throat> went down one of those children's inner tube runs so you get on an inner tube and it sounds fun but for me uh, i'm six foot five and and my kids are you know kids are four four feet tall and it's the same size inner tube but i wasn't really thinking and i get on the inner tube i get to the bottom and i'm going 35 miles an hour the tube flips i land on my head my head gets pushed straight into my chest my spine ruptures at c6 and c7 and i'm I'm paralyzed. I'm just done. And I'm like, what? It's like in a blink of an eye. It just was like blink of an eye. And so they, they get me to the hospital. They're not moving me. I got this halo on me and they're, uh, 
just checking and I'm still in shock. I don't know what's going on. Um, the, the thing about being paralyzed, you don't feel pain. So it's not like you're, you're not like you're hurting. You just can't you move. You don't feel anything. <laughs> it's like, it's yeah. as if everything is normal, but it's not normal. You can't move. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrifying, awful, again, I'm just in shock. So they go do all these tests and, um, and my brother was with me and my very good friend Antonio was with me and my wife was with me. And so I knew I was in the best, like these guys are going to, they were going to call everyone to, to see what, what could be done. And I, um, so I, I kind of let myself be in their hands. Meanwhile, I'm just, um, processing and I had, I had honestly, uh, I had this voice of God, like, I, I don't know how else to describe it. This complete clear message that said, you're going to be fine. And when you are fine, you're going to work to help kids connect to food. And I was just a download. Where, like I, <laughs> where is that coming from? Like, I'm like, in fact, I'm having a little discussion. What's going on here. And it was this complete clear voice over and over and over again, very calm. And meanwhile, I'm, I'm in like five car alarm hospital situation. Everyone's freaking out. And I've got this clear voice. You're going to work with kids and you're going to help them connect to food. I didn't know how, I didn't know what I was going to do but I knew I was going to do that. And so I went into surgery. It was, took, them, took them three days to bring the right surgeons in. It took them three days. I was paralyzed the whole time and it was just pure terror, pure shock. And I woke up, uh, it was a Sunday, I broke my neck. I woke up on a Wednesday morning and I, and I could move. I mean, I was, I was, uh, I needed to be horizontal for two months. I choose a rehab to walk again. It was brutal, but I could move. And, um, uh, it was, uh, it was, this was the clear voice. It wasn't like this that clear voice was a flash. It was a just constantly beautiful, clear voice. And, uh, and I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to go work on kids and food. And so my wife, Jen Luan at the time, uh, she and I started working on this idea of gardens and school. I started looking at a lot of ideas because I, I you, it was a lot of mental space when you can't move your body. You <laughs> know, so. So I'm, I'm not paralyzed at this point, but I can't move my body much because I've got to look after it while it's healing. So let me horizontal. I literally have to be horizontal 24 hours a day, except for the restroom. I'm allowed, allowed to get up to go to the restroom with like a, with a halo on. And, um, uh, but, but horizontal, your mind is moving at 30,000 miles an hour. And, uh, we designed what, what became these learning gardens that are now all over the country. And, uh, uh, the, the, business model, you know, a tech guy. So I couldn't help but have a business model for this, even though it was a nonprofit, um, was to, to, the business model was to turn the whole idea around, which the pre previous school gardens were, were on, on grade, you know, in the corner of the schoolyard, so, you know, some parents would come in and they would just kind of make, make, make a couple of little things and like, a, a little, little beds and it would look nice for a moment, but then it would eventually just turn into this disaster in the corner. The facilities guys didn't want to deal with it, so they put a fence around it. Those fences cost 10 grand, so it wasn't like they weren't spending money. They just didn't want to deal with it. And then the principal would have to uh, try and figure out how to look after it. It just became this complete problem for the principal and facilities. Teachers wouldn't use it because you had to have a lock and key to get through the gate. And then the kids, of course, couldn't go in without, without a teacher. I, I decided... Let's try and turn it around. Let's put money into the, in, let's invest in the garden. Let's put, you know, 30 to $50,000 into it, build something beautiful, build it out of playground equipment material that is food safe, that's ADA accessible, that is raised up. Uh, go to biggreen.org, get a feel for the beauty of, of the products that we, we created. And um, by the time COVID hit, we'd, we'd actually installed 650 beautiful 2000 square foot out, outdoor classroom shade structures and everything. And it was really amazing. And I'm so proud of the team and, and the group that I work with. We, we moved mountains to make that possible. When COVID hit, we were not allowed to work in school. So we changed our model to, we call it the big green Dow, which is a, a collective of nonprofits that, that vote on which other nonprofits should receive funding and including receive some equipment. So the equipment that we, Created is beautiful and very useful. All right, which which nonprofit out there in Atlanta or Detroit or Baltimore or these sort of some of these challenged neighborhoods 
which ones do we want to learn about and possibly provide them some funding, some equipment, and some teachings? And now we're, we've grown that up to 150 nonprofits. And we, um, we bring them together once a year in, in Denver, and they spend two to three days together, and they teach each other things that they know. So it's like a learning together um, a process because some, some nonprofits are really good at fundraising. Some nonprofits are really good at working with school districts. Some nonprofits know how to grow in these, these, this geography or that geography. And um, some, some nonprofits know politics really well and how do you get politicians to engage in what you're doing. So these beautiful learnings that we're now able to bring together rather than, rather than us tell nonprofits what to do, we actually are asking them to tell us and we participate as a nonprofit, and it's one of my most joyful few days in the year is to go sit with this uh, mostly BIPOC community because our communities we serve are BIPOC mostly, and um, uh, and it's a uh, it's absolutely wonderful. It's it's just Big Green has become a joy. Uh, we um, we we really celebrate raising funds for these absolutely superstar nonprofits, but they're small, they're young, they're uh, not necessarily young, but they, they are small and they want to, they want to be small. They're, they want to serve their community. And it's, it's worked out so well. And I'm so proud of that time and continues to be, continues to unfold like this year. Yeah. I wonder what this will be like, you know, it's more, yeah. more of that kind of feeling. And I'm sure you've seen, you know, in the impact in the schools, because, you know, you're, it seems like you've, you've yeah. seen tragedy has kind of given birth to lots of good things in your life, right? It gave 9-11, gave birth to the kitchen and your own accident and brush with, you know, paralysis for the rest of your life made you inspired to give back and do something for kids. And, and, and now, you know, with COVID, you basically have a new model for empowering other nonprofits. So it's, it's a gift that keeps on giving. I hope you don't have to have any more tragedy. Tra tra exactly. have, have, have another we, we <laughs> vision just, of what you want to do. I just learn in other ways. <laughs> exactly. exactly. I, I, my joke but, about my accident, my neck break was if not for the physical trauma, I highly recommend the psychological awakening. <laughs> exactly right. No, I, I get you on that one. I've had my own journeys with, <laughs> with uh, sickness and make you kind of look at things differently. What I, what I want to hear about more is what happened to the kids. You you go to these schools. You you take places where kids are struggling, where they don't have access to good food, where they're not connected to nature, and you create an environment for them to immerse themselves in, to learn about food, to grow food, to eat the food, to cook the food. What what are the impacts you're seeing on these kids and their life, their academic? Performance, their mood, ADD, the whole spectrum of things you might expect when you use yeah, food. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's absolutely. I really believe growing food changes lives. It it is such a beautiful. Um, uh, I believe it didn't change lives for kids, but also for adults. But but when we work with our children, we work. Um, I mean, we're working now probably at over a million kids a day. I mean, and it's truly. Uh, when I say we work, we work through our nonprofits. I mean, it, we are we we are at scale. And um, when I get the opportunity to go and be with kids in the gardens, which I love, uh, I'm still shocked. We, we, we go and install a garden and I, I'll, the kids will come out. We were, very, we were very thoughtful about it, what we grow in the garden. We don't grow things kids don't want to eat, but we love carrots. We love cherry tomatoes. We love strawberries. We, we love uh, um, uh, cilantro and we'll do, we'll do, we we'll, we'll actually we'll like make there's a we'll we'll design it. This is a garden that makes pizza, like it's got <laughs> pizza garden. I like that. It's got, That's gonna win some <laughs> win some friends and little kids for sure. That's <laughs> right. Well, this is a garden that makes salsa and it's got cilantro and onions and things like that, so the kids can relate to it because they don't know what food is. They just know the packaged version of food, and so I'll I'll literally show kids a tomato, and they will ask me what is that, and it is. It is just so sad that we have uh, our whole next generation. And this is not their fault. I mean, they, they're, they're kids that they have no connection. They have no, not even food literacy. And I, um, I love uh, when they, when, especially with the cherry tomato, when they, 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 they kind of, it, gets, it becomes a game. They kind of dare each other to try it because they've never had one. Never had one. I mean, it's, but it's a wonderful little game. And then eventually someone tries it and they're like, oh, my God, that's great. And then yeah, one exactly. after the other, they're all, they're all diving in to, their, to have a cherry yeah. tomato. And, and so we get such joy out of it. Um, one, one of the things that I think that, that is so powerful about growing food 
with kids is this concept of nutrition security. Oh, it's yeah. Not, Talk about that. It's what not, is that? Uh, um, like you could just, you're seven years old, you're going to go grow food whenever, because you're, you're only seven. But but these kids live in hunger. They live in, in really difficult times. They live in, in, in poor neighborhoods. And when, when you have a different relationship to food that you know that you can grow it, um, it is it just changes the psychological fear of, of starvation or hunger. And that is really powerful. So you get it, you get, it improves your nutrition security. It also improves your mental health. These kids come out into the classroom and, and, and it's outdoors and they're in nature. Um, that, that is one of the greatest uh, gifts of growing food is, um, and I'll say that about cooking as well. The growing food, cooking, it's meditative. It's, um, it is a beautiful way to spend uh, some time. Um, what our kids will do in, in, a, in, in recess, you know, you can go kick a ball around or you can go climb the playground. But if you want to read a book, you go to the garden. And so it also offers this uh, calming, <clears throat> this calming environment. Um, and then, and then one of the other things that I, I believe is a, is a, is a sign of the times is it also opens your eyes to the weather volatility created by climate change. And, um, years ago, you grow food, you, you, you pretty much know how the weather is. And nowadays it's, uh, it's sad, but it's, but it's a powerful lesson how, how sudden strange weather will destroy your, what you've been growing. And that becomes a lesson that we, we treat it in a positive, like, what did we learn here? What did we learn about how climate has, has affected uh, the garden? What, what is more resilient? What is less resilient? And, and how can we change? And, and again, you're working with kids who are seven to 10 years old, but they, they, they yeah, get it. They get it. Yeah. And so it's, it's a growing food changes their lives and it helps us create a generation of kids as they get older that do understand more about climate change and how it's affecting their, uh, their lives. Um, and, um, I really, really feel it. I feel how much growing food changes lives. It's so true. And it's, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, people don't realize is that cooking and growing food are human activities that have been going on for probably hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah, exactly. And they're kind of essential to what makes us human. I mean, Michael yeah. Pollan talks about this in his book, Cooked. He says, when we learn to cook is when we became truly human. And and the the yeah, that's beautiful, act yeah. of cooking the the act of of actually having your fingers in the dirt of doing something real that's why I really love cooking because so much of my life is you know digital computers and writing and all this stuff and actually getting in the kitchen and having like last night we made this, this delicious chicken I had to work you know pasture raised chicken and I kind of pounded it down and put a little uh, egg and flour on it and put it in a pan with some olive oil delicious and we roasted some shiitake mushrooms and oh, amazing. brussels sprouts and a little peas it was a very simple dinner and and it just you know I, i'm busy working all day and i get in the kitchen it's like you just feel like you're doing something authentically human and, and yeah, I, just, I love it's that true. experience i i when i come home from work um i my kids hold me accountable so we we they since they were born and now they're my oldest are 21 uh, my youngest is 11 so it's been a while I have cooked for them and uh, the, I've made them sit down for dinner and we do our little gratitudes. And in the morning I'll cook breakfast. And, um, um, and as they've gotten older, they went through a little bit of a re rebellious phase where, sure they do. where they're like, oh, <laughs> no, not for me, but it was a very short phase. And then, and then I was like, okay, but I'm still going to do it with the other kids. You, you just, you're just not going to sit with us. And I'm not here to be, I'm not going to guilt trip you, but it's pretty nice. And now when I'm with our kids, they're like, we're definitely sitting down for dinner. Where's dad? He has to be here. I'm like, oh, now, so now I'm the one that has to get, I gotta, uh, we, we all cook now, it's not just me, but we, we celebrate that moment, which can be five minutes long, where we just take a moment to eat our food and, and connect as a family. And we do it around 6 p.m. And, and I might go back to work or I might, or the kids might go do their, their homework. But sometimes we have something to talk about and we will talk for an hour, hour and a half. And sometimes we will have something funny to share and it's, and we'll laugh for an hour and we'll be together in that time that is so special that you just don't get if you don't create the container. So you just, the container is, Let's cook a little food and let's um, uh, sit together, and we we take a moment of gratitude and um, um, 
that container sets us off sometimes in the most beautiful directions and it's without obligation, but I, but it's just a gift that I've given myself. Um, and I really believe food is a gift and if, if, if it's a gift we give ourselves three times a day, like let's make it a good one. Yeah. But and, I mean, Campbell, uh, what you're saying is so important. You know, you're talking about it from a personal perspective of being connected with your family and the meaning it has for you in your life and the way it brings you together and sharing time and stories and laughter. But there's so much science about the family dinner and families who eat together and not even cook together, but should eat together and then cook together be more, have lower rates of obesity, eating disorders, ADHD, have better academic performance, less suicide. It's quite amazing to see the data uh, from, from as, as a doctor to see the scientific data around the power of family dinners and of staying. I love that you, you know, I mean, I, I, I have it anecdotally for me. I love that it shows up in the data. That makes total sense to me. Our kids, just like all kids go through tough times. And when we sit down and we eat together, sometimes those tough times are talked about, but actually what I think is really beautiful about it is it's an anchor for them that they may have to deal with their own tough times without us because it's something to do with their, they want to share with their, with their, with their parents, with their siblings, but it's an anchor. They, they know that that's going to happen. It's, 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 um, it truly, I believe, uh, truly at their base nervous system, um, makes, makes our kids happier, happier kids. And it makes me and my wife happier. Like we, it's actually, it's, uh, it's, it, you'd even call it selfish. Like I want it. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I think, you know, what's, what's so important about your cookbook, uh, the kitchen, which everybody should get a copy of, and it's, 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 it's subtitle is cooking for your community or could be cooking for your family is that it invites us into the kitchen. It breaks down cooking into a simple steps to make delicious meals. So you don't have to be intimidated. And my mother always said to me, if you can read, you can cook. And so yeah, right. if, you can read a, if you can read a recipe and follow the directions, it's going to yes. come out, right? Yes. It's going to come out. Don't skip steps. Don't, I mean, and it, and it actually teaches you how, how to cook. And so the recipes are in a sense an instruction manual for how to cook. And then you begin to improvise and have fun on your own. But I would say everybody should get this cookbook, invite some friends over, get your family together, get the food, make it together and try it. It's, 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 it's surprisingly easy to do this. And, and yet we have this mental barrier of how, oh, I don't know how to cook. I can't do this. It's too difficult. And there's a, a story I want to share for a minute with, about a family I visited in South Carolina in one of the worst food deserts in America. And it was part of the movie Fed Up that I did about 10 years ago with Katie Kirk and Lori David. And this family was incredibly sick. The father was 42 on dialysis from having diabetes and kidney failure at 42. The mother was probably a hundred plus pounds of her weight. The son was a, you know, huge, 16 years old, almost diabetic, about 50% body fat. A kid should be 10 to 20. And they never cooked a meal. Everything was a packaged box of can. And we just cooked one simple meal together. I taught them how to make uh, chili from scratch, how to make salad from scratch, how to make salad dressing from scratch, how to, you know, roast a potato, how to stir fry an asparagus, just simple things. I said, listen, I don't think it'll work, but here's a guide on how to eat well for less. Here's a cookbook that I wrote. Just go ahead and, and try this. And I, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't have cutting boards. They didn't have knives. I sent them knives. I sent them cutting boards. And within the first week, the mother texted me back. We lost 18 pounds as a family. In a year, they lost 200 pounds. And they did it by just cooking simple, real food together. For a family of five, they lived on food stamps and disability, had a thousand bucks a month for food for a family of five. And they were able to do this. Um, and so this was an, sort of an example to me of how we're really only one meal away from solving some of it so much of what's wrong with America. You're, you're totally right. We are, I love that phrase, so one meal away. The, the, um, the idea that, that eating, uh, cooking at home is more expensive. It's just not true. If you go to McDonald's and you eat for a family of four, you're going to pay 30 to $35. You go to a grocery store, um, a normal grocery store and you buy a chicken and, uh, you know, some vegetables for the side or some potatoes, you're probably not going to spend more than $10. No. And you, and you will go to have big box stores like Costco the easiest like you meal really you could possibly yeah. cook, and you'll get to cook with, cook with your family in a food that's very accessible, very delicious. Um, now you can spend more money if if, if you want, but but actually uh, we have we have uh, um, we have the ability to eat eat affordably. But but it's your, your phrase of we're one meal away is exactly right. It's beautiful. Where just give it a try, just go and. 
say to your family, I'm going to go cook. And I think what's also a great lesson that I've learned is don't say you're going to cook once. Say that you're going to cook four or five times because yeah. you want to get a little confidence. You know, I got lucky on my first <laughs> one when I cooked that chicken and it came out perfectly. <laughs> don't put that much pressure on yourself. Like get, tell your family and friends, I'm going to cook four or five times. And by that fourth or fifth time, you, you will have you will have hit it and you will hit home, especially when you use good recipes. Please try some from the book, but there are many great recipes out there for the food you love. And um, uh, but yeah, just just dedicate a, 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 a few hours of practice, meaning like the first the first four are practice and the fifth one is real. But frankly, you're going to hit it right probably within that first two or three. So um, so I really think uh, you're one meal away from from changing your life in a beautiful, beautiful way. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here. Glycation leads to us literally cooking from the inside, like a piece of yeah. toast in the toaster. That's what happens. And then when we're fully cooked, we die. <laughs> That's why we die. And so the yeah. more glucose spikes in your diet, the faster you age.